thank you so much for letting me interview you today because I, I didn't really know anything about you. And I was looking at your stuff and I was like, she is a star. Like, <laughs> I was like obsessed with you instantly. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, and she has a gap. I was like, okay. Like, I really <laughs> You're like, twins. I love a gap. You know, it's good luck, right? So. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. But I wanted to, because I was looking you up, I was just trying to like get your background and stuff. And you didn't have much information about like how you kind of got started in music in the sense of like what initially inspired you. Did you do the church choir or how did you kind of get started in music? Well, I started, you know, just like everyone else. I started singing in church when I was little. Mm -hmm. My whole family is musical. My grandma was the pastor of our church and owner of our church, my grandma and grandpa. And my dad was like over the music at the church. So I started singing really young. There was always music in the house. So, but I've always wanted to be a pop star my whole life, but I didn't really know how to make that happen. I didn't even know that you could I knew you could make it, but I didn't know that you could make it and not be like Britney Spears or like mm. Usher, or, you know, a Brandy or whatever. So I went towards Broadway first because I had to get a vocal surgery when I was 18. I had a cyst on my vocal cords from singing gospel music, from cheerleading and screaming because I was a professional, uh, like a competitive cheerleader in high school. I had to get it removed so I couldn't do the music program. And they were like, well, if you wait a year, you can audition for the musical theater program. And then that's how I got into musical theater. And then from there, it was just kind of like a whirlwind adventure. <laughs> I started working at theme parks. Um, I worked at Hershey Park. And then I worked at theaters and dinner theaters all over the country. And then I finally got um, my big break in Book of Mormon. So I did Book of Mormon on Broadway and on tour and then Aladdin on Broadway. That was mm -hmm. like my first big Broadway show and then something rotten and then I got asked to come to London to do dream girls and then it just has taken off <laughs> since then but it's just definitely been it was it started with you know my love of music in church and I think that really mm -hmm. helped because you know in church you're taught how to move people with your voice yeah. the same thing that you do when you're telling a story or if you're in a musical you mm -hmm. want to move with your voice what do you want your voice and your presence to bring to like musical theater and Broadway? Well, currently what it is bringing is a new voice. Um, mm. I think there has been a reckoning that's been happening this year, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement and a call for more diversity is that Broadway is predominantly white and it is very mm. racist and it has been. It was never made for us, if that makes yeah. sense. So we're trying to reclaim an art form that was never meant for us to be there in the first place. So that's kind of what I'm doing with what I'm doing. I'm reclaiming our time. I'm reclaiming our space. I'm reclaiming the narrative that, you know, they're sassy, angry black girl that's not gonna fly anymore. We're more than that. We're better than that. We can do that. We are sassy, but we also cry. We're also vulnerable and we're also weak and strong and complex and quirky and smart and you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think for me, I'm representing a renaissance in the theater industry where we're not going to just take what you give us. We're going to actually grow and, and break that glass ceiling that's kind of been over our heads for a long time. I love that. I love that so much. I know it was an amazing opportunity, but what really made you like jump into London musical theater? And then how do you feel that the experience of the, how do you feel like the experience has like changed your career? It changed everything. Well, I was, you know, in the ensembles of Broadway shows, I was always understudying the leads or a feature, big feature ensemble where I would come out, steal the show, and then be gone. Mm. And come out, steal the show, and then be gone. So I, you know, that was good. I call it my bread and butter. Okay, you make your money. You got to do what you got to do to then be able to show them what, what else you can do, you know. So I always wanted more. I always, I got my first taste of playing a lead on Broadway in something rotten, and I'm playing opposite this white man. And we're not, well, Brian Darcy James, not even just a white man. He's like the king of Broadway. <laughs> like they, and he's the best. Like they're, they're leading man, they're every man. And I'm playing his wife. And I was like, whoa, 
it just opened my eyes to see that it is possible and that like, mm. okay, why am I selling myself so short? Why are they selling all of us so short that we can do mm -hmm. so much more? So then um, from there, I got asked to play uh, Effie White in Dreamgirls, like randomly because Amber Riley was playing the lead. Um, she got sick. She didn't have, they didn't have enough coverage to cover her uh, while she was sick. So, and the show was just opening and they were like, can you come now to do this? And I was like, okay. And I've always, I've always led my whole career and in my actions with an open heart. I just say yes and then see what happens. <laughs> Cause I just trust that the universe is taking me and God is leading me in the right direction of where I'm supposed to be mm -hmm. going. So I'm like, if he gives me this opportunity, it's obviously meant for me to run with it. And so I was only supposed to be there three weeks. Um, I ended up staying two years. <laughs> Um, I shared the role with Amber for the first year and then the second year I took over the role and um, they loved me here and it was just like for the first time I felt like I didn't have to change who I was to be accepted by everyone like I just came as myself and I stood in that power and that was so hard because I was like covering for Amber Riley who everybody loved and wanted to you know it's Glee. They saw Glee. They wanted to see her. And then there was me there like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a definitely a, a good exercise in just being like, you know what? I'm enough and I'm going to give them my performance. And if they like it, great. If they don't, who cares? But a lot of them did. So they stood up like every night I sung it, I'm telling you. And those fans have stuck with me through this whole four years. And I've done three more shows here. I have a record deal now with Universal and DECA and I just sing for the queen. So I was like, you know what? I think yes. I'm doing fine. Right. I'm just gonna keep doing that. <laughs> That's so amazing. How many times have you been singing for the queen? Has it been several times? Well, it's been twice, but all last year. So the first time, this is funny because, so they have this thing called Festival of Remembrance for the queen. So you might've heard mm -hmm. on, you know, on the news and stuff, they were talking about Meg Markle and Harry not being able to go to this Festival of Remembrance, which is like a big deal. Anyway, so Festival of Remembrance is like Veterans Day for mm -hmm. a Memorial Day uh, here. And this is a huge, uh, Brit very British thing. So the girl who was going to be doing the opening number, her uh, cleaner got coronavirus. <laughs> mm. So I, so they called me. And they were like, can you get to the Royal Albert Hall an hour and a half? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and they were like, do you know the White Cliffs of Dover? And I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, I <laughs> Girl, I didn't know that song. That's not, that's like, that's like a British song. I knew, I knew the chorus, but I didn't know the verse. You didn't, like, you know a song, but you don't know it well enough to sing it in front of yeah. the queen. <laughs> million people with no rehearsal so i just did it i was just like okay i've done this before i came and substituted for amber why couldn't i come sing for the queen why not so i learned the song in the car my glam squad is literally like in herod's running through the stores trying to find me a dress and then i get there and it's like zamunda in there like everyone's like in furs and like this full hundred piece orchestra and marching band for the queen is there and i go out there and i'm i'm a black american woman plus sized woman opening the show for the queen like it was just amazing experience. and then i smashed it out of the park i just like you know what you just have to take those opportunities and just run with it but that was the first time i sang and then last the second time i sang she invited me to come sing because she heard my song on the radio so she invited me to come sing all right, I just got chills when you said that. That's so amazing. <laughs> she heard my song on the radio and they called and were like, who is singing that? And they were like, it's Marisha Wallace. And she's like, well, I want her to sing at my Royal Variety performance. And like Lady Gaga's performed there, Beyonce, Aretha Franklin. Like it's been going on since the 60s, that talent show. So it was amazing. How did you transition into like Jingle Jango and singing in movies because I know there's definitely a difference between singing live and then going in the studio and recording specifically for a movie. So can you talk about that process a little bit? 
Well, Jingle Jangle was filmed here. So I worked on Aladdin. Mm -hmm. Um, the live action movie with Will Smith. I sing, uh, still I think he's rather tasty. That's me in the movie. <laughs> but the same team that was working on that was working on Jingle Jangle here in London as well. Um, and I had auditioned for Mrs. Johnston and I actually couldn't do it because I was doing Waitress. But uh, David Talbert's wife messaged me and was like, we love you. Will you come work on the music for this, um, for the movie? And I was like, okay. I mean, <laughs> they told me he was gonna work on it. Like I was gonna work with John Legend and work with, um, and uh, Harvey Mason Jr. who is like the COO of the Grammys right now, which is so crazy. Mm -hmm. Like vocal produced me, like the head of the Grammys. I was like, what is this? So, and it was also nice cause I could get to create it and I, I love being on the other side of the table, not just, you know, on camera, but I like being on the creative side as well, because I feel like as a black woman, we don't get that many opportunities to be on the other side. They love to like mm -hmm. tell us what to do, but they don't really allow us to create the work. And they would ask me, so what do you want to do there? Like, what risks? Should we add this? Should we do that? Well, you know, it was really cool to be a part of the full creative process of it. And then when it came out, I was like, I'm on an album with Usher and Ricky Martin. <laughs> I was for sure they were gonna like replace me with like Patti LaBelle or something. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> not the time to come cover this on as well. But no, they kept me on there. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so when you say create, you got to be on the creative side, do you mean like writing the song or also like being involved with the actual character of Miss Johnston? Yeah, like being involved with how her voice would sound like, what, cause he wanted, um, cause David Talbert was in love with like Tremaine Hawkins and the Clark mm -hmm. sisters and that authentic like gospel sound. And um, that's what we wanted to put in that, in that movie. Cause we wanted it to be like a real black experience, but black excellence where, mm -hmm. you know, cause you know how like we hear our sound, but it's always watered down or it's like, don't wear out <laughs> too much. Don't rip too much. Don't let it be too heavy. Da, da, da. So, but they just let me like go. They were like, we want all of the stanky growls and everything. So it was really cool. I loved creating it. Oh, that's awesome. Because I had no idea that that was even a voiceover. Like she was able, like she looked like she fit that voice in general, you know? Yeah. Not just like her lip sync was on, but it sounded like it could definitely be her. She's so that's, amazing. that's Lisa Davina and she, uh, Davina Phillips. She's awesome. But we, cause you know, in that situation, it could be weird. Cause you're like, that's my voice and she's the character. But we were like, we came together to create an amazing, Character. So it is all about women celebrating women's accomplishments. So no competition there. Like it was just all love and I loved it. Nice. Yeah, I, I love to hear that too. So I see recently that you've been doing like master classes on IG. And first of all, I just love how engaged you are on IG. I love how you like use TikTok and you're just like coming up with games and breaking down songs. Like I think it's amazing. Um, but how has social media like elevated? your singing and also just like, I guess your career. Cause I feel like it's probably led to opportunities as well. Absolutely. Well, I use social media to promote my single charity single that came out last year. So <clears throat> I did a gospel version of tomorrow from Annie mm -hmm. and I recorded it myself in my house and I did it for charity to raise money for actors and performers and backstage people who are out of work because of the pandemic. And then it all came, you know, everything. Do you remember that weekend when everything went black? Like Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter happened and people were like, we're not doing the internet today. Like we're out, this is crazy. It was the weekend of the blackout and my my song dropped that weekend. And it was, and it was almost like it transformed it into this song of hope for mm -hmm. everything, for the movement, for coronavirus. And they, and uh, one of the major radio stations played it that Sunday of that weekend. And it just went viral and it was the internet. Like we created a music video with uh, Leslie Odom Jr., Leia Salonga, uh, Ladisi. We raised over um, $8,000 for each charity. Like it was amazing. And I got a record deal from that. 
And the Queen um, heard that song and that's how I got to sing for the Queen. But that was all because of social media and how power, now social media is even more powerful, but now mm -hmm. we're realizing it, that we can use it for good as well. That's the thing that people don't understand that people are like, you know, social media is bad, blah, blah, blah. but social media can be good. It's all about the people who are creating the content. We are the creators of the content. Like we, mm -hmm. we put the bad vibes out there and we also put the good vibes out there. So I wanted to create a space on the internet that's positive, that um, people can come to learn. I always felt like the singing world was so competitive and catty and shady and it made people not want to sing who had talent. It made people who, who you know, just want to sing for fun, not feel comfortable to sing because they're being judged by everyone. I just feel like I'm creating a space online where people can feel safe and um, positive. Can you tell me a little more about the vocal intensive and like what you're teaching people? And yeah, can you break it down for me? Well, all my teaching starts with confidence building first because you could be the best singer in the world, but if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter because your voice is so intrinsically connected to who you are as a person and what you've been through and people who've been through trauma or been through abusive relationships or abusive families, you know, they feel like their voice is taken. Like they don't mm -hmm. even, they can't even use their voice to speak, let alone to sing. So I go into the psychosis of why you're not singing or why, you know, what is stopping you from projecting or giving it your all. A lot of times people are scared. They're scared to belt, they're scared to mess up. They're scared, you know what I mean? They're, a lot, they're scared to make mistakes. They're just so afraid to not be perfect that they're stopping themselves from, you know, succeeding. So that's what we teach in the vocal intensive. I teach people how to belt really high notes. People get lots of extension on their range through relaxation techniques that I teach and also just vocal technique because a lot of people don't have $150 an hour, $200 an hour to go learn how to sing correctly. I do want to talk about um, some upcoming projects you have because I know you're doing feeling good or is it feel good yeah, or feel feeling good? good. Feel, feel good. good. Yeah. yeah with Eve. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and how you got into like like starting to act and not just sing? Yeah well I've always been an actor singer because I had to act in the plays and musicals and things that I've done but this is my first mm -hmm major TV role. And it's so funny because the day that I announced my record deal was the same day that I got this TV show. <laughs> Blessings. So like, whoa, I was, when she called me, I was like, are you kidding me? Like what's happening? And like, I'm working with Lisa Kudrow and Mae Martin and Eve. I was more starstruck with Eve than I was even with Lisa Kudrow because Eve is like, EVE, -E, you know, I'm like, yes. like my childhood. I'm like, and she was so nice. Oh my gosh, she's the nicest. Cool. Eve is exactly how you want Eve to be. Cool, chill, amazing, unaffected by fame. Just like a mm -hmm. nice cool down. And then like we had all these scenes together because she plays my counselor in the show and I'm in a rehab and I'm like a crazy <laughs> a crazy patient but, <laughs> but yeah it was just amazing and then like we became friends like working on the set because we just got a chance to bond and we're like oh my god american black girl in london we gotta hold on to each other <laughs> but yeah no she's amazing and like she moved here because she for the same reasons as me she doesn't feel held back at all by her race or the genre of music that she uh you know wants to do they let her do everything I just did her podcast for uh, BBC Sounds and she was like, I didn't get any opportunities like that in America. Nobody took me seriously as mm -hmm. far as like being a serious actress or you know what I mean? So here they just, she just gets to be herself and like it, it we really bonded over that. But the show is coming out um, this spring. Um, it just got announced, it'll be on Netflix. Um, I'm yeah. so excited for everyone to see it. That's awesome. So do you feel like, cause 
uh, there are so many like Americans and they'll be like these like British actors are coming over and taking our roles and they're playing black Americans so well. But for you, what has been, I mean, I know you've said that the experience going to London has been like so freeing for you, but what do you feel yeah. like you would want to tell black actors when they, if they are considering like coming to London or just trying to figure out different ways to break into the industry? Um, I would say do it. I would say um, it's just a whole different market over here, especially if you feel like you're in an oversaturated place like LA or New York or whatever. You feel like you'll just have, you'll stand out over here and you will, um, you have more space because you just can, there's not as much competition. It's still very competitive because you have these amazing like real Shakespearean actors here. So like when I got a TV show here, I was like, oh, I did real good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the acting is like intense, like really great actors here. So I would just say, come and give it a shot. Also, you get access to the whole world here. Like I have fans in Europe now and mm. Japan and Asia, like all different places because London is kind of the hub for the rest of the world in certain in certain ways. So it was just nice to feel like there's something beyond, you know, Broadway. There's something beyond LA. So I think I would just say there is more and to go for it because I'm so glad that I did. I feel like I have come into myself here. And sometimes it takes leaving your home to be fully appreciated. And then mm -hmm. now everyone at home appreciates me because they see all what I've done here, which is, which is all right. Well, you are like, to me, I see you as being so fearless and I just wish you the best with everything you're doing. And I can't wait to see like what TV shows you're going to be on next. And I just really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me and good. I hope everything blows up for you in your life and you have all the success as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.